Hello there and welcome to CNM's Herbal Medicine Plant Identification Walk. We've come back down here to the beautiful Sussex countryside and the last time we were here it was high summer so most of what we were looking at was in flower. Now as we move just about on the turn to autumn some leaves already beginning to turn yellow literally just on the cusp there we're going to see some differences. In particular, of course, many of the flowers have turned to seed or berries, which of course are seed heads in their own right. And we've got some of the plants that we looked at last time we'll be seeing again this time. But we're also hoping to make the point that it's good to see plants at various stages of their life cycle. Because sometimes, you know, people over rely on flowers, for example, for identifying uh, plants. But it's good to be able to identify them when they've gone down, when they've gone to seed, or when they're even just wilting right down. Because, for example, if you want to harvest a root, you can't harvest it in the summer. All the energy of the plant is in the, uh, in the upper parts of it. You want to wait till it goes down below the earth. So you, you need to know where that plant is and be able to recognise it in that state as well. So around this location we have old pasture land, we have meadows and we have woodland. So pretty much an ideal place to look for some good medicinal plants in the wild. Let's go and see what we can find. So Last time we saw hawthorn, we were looking at the flowers. And these days, I think I mentioned at the time, uh, herbalists prefer to use a mixture of the flowering tops, that's the young leaves and the flowers in the spring or actually in May. So we're kind of going into summer with that one, early summer. Late summer, of course, the flowers are over and we get these beautiful uh, red, typically bright red hawthorn berries. This is why, these are haws, actually, this is why it's called hawthorn. And uh, although um, both parts of the plant are very effective, and we know them as a cardiovascular remedy, for example, for taking down blood pressure, uh, but also to some extent for cleaning the blood as well, um, particularly their antioxidant property to make sure that you know, we're getting rid of things that we don't need in there. But the berries, it turns out, have uh, a special property all of their own. And that, that is, they have a lot of rutin. And rutin is a nutrient that helps to maintain the elasticity of blood vessels. So another example would be a condition called peripheral edema, or swelling of the, uh, the lower limbs, the ankles in particular, due to leakiness of the, uh, of the arteries there. And that actually is a really, really good remedy for that. I mean, I remember treating an 80-year-old professor in Cambridge, University who had peripheral edema and all it took basically was tincture of hawthorn berries. So I just happened on these on the way down the road here. Let's go further and see what we can find. So I just noticed the um, elder berry has just come out here. Um, and again, last time we saw elder, we were looking at the flower and I think the berries were just coming out, but they were green. These ones, of course, are, are the nice fully ripe black elder berries. They are much beloved of birds. Uh, they have, as we discussed before, uh, very significant antiviral properties, but the birds know about that too. So you don't have much of a window to pick elderberry. Once it's out, it's over pretty quickly. Uh, and once you pick them, you've also got to do what you want to do with them, whether it's drying them, tincturing them, or making elderberry syrup or whatever you want to do, you've got to do it quick. You haven't got much time. They'll start to go off and start actually to, um, to get um, fungi growing on them and all sorts of things. So, uh, so be quick with this one. If you know where they are, there's not an awful lot of them here. Sometimes there are big panicles of them. This is just a, a little example. All aspects of the plant, all parts of the plant, actually, the, the flowers uh, and actually the leaves as well are good antivirals. The leaves can actually, actually make you a bit sick, so be careful with those ones. You need to know how to prepare them properly. Uh, but the berries, again, you know, like many berries, you can make a syrup out of them, store them over the winter months and have plenty to last you uh, to, uh, to help to upgrade your immune system over the winter. So let's, uh, let's carry on and see what else is around. So 
So I just found this really characterful little patch of red clover here, growing up amongst the thistles, actually. Um, and uh, red clover is actually trifolium pretense in uh, Latin. Uh, trifolium means three leaves, and of course you already know that clovers have three leaves, except when they have four. Um, and pretense means of the meadow, so that's pretty accurate for where we are right now. Now this is a really important medicinal plant in the Western herbal medicine traditions. It's actually a very, very gentle plant and it actually has nervine, almost like sedative properties as well. So you can make a really relaxing but also cleansing tea out of red clover. And it occurs in Northern American herbal medicine in many formulae that have to do basically with blood cleansing. So it's a plant that's considered to be able to remove impurities from the blood and also uh, from the lymph. So it, you know, it, it, it's part of formulae for liver detoxification, for the urinary tract, for the lymph, you know, anywhere where you want to uh, enhance the cleansing of the blood, uh, then red clover is going to be a, big, uh, a good choice. And um, it's also, by the way, a member of the pea family. A lot of the pea family members are very rich in phytoestrogens. That's plant hormones that mimic uh, human estrogen. So they can be used for female reproductive uh, tract complaints as well. So for example, uh, menopausal women can take red clover and it will supplement a certain amount of the estrogen that's lost at that time of, of life. And the other useful thing about it is that it will bind to estrogen receptors preferentially to one's own estrogen and the most powerful form of estrogen that we have is estradiol uh, which is often um, you know found to be in reproductive tract complaints in women found to be dominant so a lot of uh, dysmenorrhea for example period pains period problems are to do with estrogen dominance a lot of other pathologies of the female reproductive tract to do with um, estrogen dominance so for such a wide range of medicinal applications, really powerful medicinal applications from this really delicate, uh, unassuming little flower, I think it's really beautiful. So this one is Angelica sylvestris. Uh, sylvestris actually means of the wood, and here we are on the edge of this uh, rather lovely uh, sylvan scene. And um, as I promised, you know, we have some great locations here for finding uh, medicinal plants. So this is a member of a very wide-ranging family that also includes celery. It actually gets its name from celery. It's called the Apaceae. Uh, used to be called the Umbellifa family, actually, or Umbelliferae. And the reason for that, if I just turn this uh, a little bit towards you so that you can see, is that um, at the top of the stalk there, all these sort of mini stalks come out and they create this umbrella of flowers. Um, this one actually has got flowers. It's got it's just flower come to the end and then this one quite well developed seed head here as well. Now, Angelica is a very close relative to a really important medicinal plant. And Angelica Archangelica actually gets its name from the Archangel Michael, who was assumed to have given it to humanity in order to fight the plague originally. Now, Angelica Archangelica is much bigger than this. That will grow up to about eight feet. This one, uh, a sort of um, diminutive relative, actually can be used in the same way. It's not quite as powerful, not quite as pungent as Angelica Archangelica, which is quite a, uh, yeah, it's quite a hot plant. Uh, so it's used for sort of dispersing mucus. So you can see why it might be useful in the plague. And you can't get Angelica Archangelica or you don't have it in your garden. This will do uh, quite as well. It's the root of the plant that we use. Obviously, we wait for the seed heads and the flowers to die down and, uh, and we get the, um, the root dug up when this is all pretty much fallen off. The root, as I say, is very pungent. It's a good warming uh, remedy for the stomach. It warms up the stomach. It helps digestion. Sometimes it's referred to as a hot bitter. And the bitter principle in herbal medicine always is something that we use to increase the, uh, uh, the secretions from not only from the stomach, but also the liver and the gallbladder as well. Uh, so it's a very, very good uh, plant to enhance 
digestion. Now another thing about it uh, is that it's uh, another relative of this plant actually is um, Angelica sinensis and that word sinensis means that it comes from China. The Chinese Angelica uh, is widely regarded as again a plant uh, that is uh, used in the treatment of female hormonal complaints. But wider than that, it's also a blood nourisher and a blood mover as well. So the pungency of the plant uh, is, uh, is circulatory uh, promoting. Blood nourishment uh, means that it's good for things like uh, anemia as well. So, you know, if you think about, um, you know, menstrual problems and maybe heavy bleeding and loss of blood leading to anemia, then Angelica is a great choice of herb to rectify that. And actually the uh, wild uh, European Angelica plants will also do the same thing. If we want to be strict about it, they have a slightly different mode of action, but they all have a similar kind of focus. And that's what I like about um, herbal medicine sometimes. You don't have to have the exact species. You can, if you know what you're doing and you can recognize a close relative, uh, then you can use that in certain cases as well. So the only thing to be slightly aware about this family as a whole, usually it's pretty benign. They can be fairly potent. They can be quite pungent and spicy. Fennel is another member of it. Um, but they also have one or two poisonous ones as well. One of the best known is Conium maculatum or hemlock. You wouldn't want to have that in your herbal remedy for your menstrual problems. So what we've got here is a very, very well-known herb. You probably already know it. This is yarrow, uh, a member of the Asteraceae family, the same family as daisy and echinacea and dandelion and burdock, a very, very big family. Um, yarrow is a, a herb that, that has, again, so many uses. The Latin name is Achillea, and it takes its name from Achilles. And I guess most people will know Achilles because he had a weak heel, so you talk about the Achilles heel, and actually it turns out that yarrow is a fantastic healing plant for the musculoskeletal system. But it's a lot more than that as well. Uh, now, the, word is, uh, the, the, the name, as I said, is Achillea millifolium, and millifolium means thousand leaves. And if you have a quick, have a really close-up look at the leaf here, and what you can see it's not like a leaf as we normally know. It's sort of fern-like in a way, but if you look really, really closely, the leaves branch out from the central stem, and then they branch again, and then they branch again into ever smaller leaflets. And this is kind of similar to the capillary system of the human body. And it turns out that yarrow is a really good remedy, remedy for strengthening capillary circulation, for strengthening the capillary beds, as we call them. The, uh, uh, the blood supply to every single part of the body depends upon these very, very small blood vessels that branch into every ever, ever, ever smaller uh, vessels. And Achillea has uh, an ability to strengthen by almost like a stringing, which means tightening up these vessels, and also to sort of equalize, as we say, the blood flow. So this plant is known as a circulatory equalizer, uh, which means that it will get the circulation where it's needed, but if it's not needed, it will also close it down. So it's actually a very good vulnerary herb for treating wounds as well. You can put Achillea on a wound and it will help to stop the bleeding and, and seal it up as well. Besides that, it's what we call a cooling diaphoretic. Now, a diaphoretic is a herb that makes you sweat, uh, and there are two types. There are cooling diaphoretics and warming diaphoretics. Cooling diaphoretics have a particular way of working. What they do is they relax the nerve supply to the pores so that it allows the sweat to flow. So one of my favourite ways to respond to a cold or, or the flu, actually, at the first sign of a fever, is to get a bunch of yarrow flowers, elder flowers, peppermint leaf, combine them all together in a pot and make just gallons of it and keep drinking it. And what it'll do is it'll start making you sweat after a while, after you've drunk a couple of cups or so of it, 
and then you'll kind of cool down with the sweat so you'll go hot and cold a lot and you do that a few times round and the antiviral properties of this plant we, we, we keep rolling them out here uh, will also help with dealing with the virus itself so you can clear a cold in a day or so with something like this so it does it by literally sweating it out of you it really is something of a cure-all uh, this plant and that brings us to the end of another herb walk and as I said before, it's great to get out there in different seasons, different times of the year, get to know the plants at different stages in their life cycle and learn to identify them. But we have been lucky with the weather today. We've got the last rays of the sun just hitting us now, but the clouds are starting to roll in. I did say it would probably be one of the last days of summer. So I'm going to call it a day right now, and I really hope to see you again on the next one.